Well, Frank, that's very kind of you. Um, thank you for that, that um, very generous introduction. Um, so let's go ahead and talk about X-ray photoelectron spectroscopy. Um, this is a technique that we've had a lot of experience with over the years in my research group at Brigham Young University. I thought I would give you just a sense here for the area um, that I live in and, and, and work in. Uh, this top picture here shows Brigham Young University. Um, this is the south end of the campus. This is the Benson Science Building. This is where I work. So my office is up on this floor right here. This is the new Life Sciences Building. Um, this is a, a, another university in the valley. This is um, Utah, um, Utah Valley University, UVU. Um, this is Mount Timpanogos. Um, anyway, you can, this is, the, I think this is Y Mountain right here. So the mountains are very close to us and it's, um, there's quite a, quite a lot of natural beauty here. A lot of people come to Utah to ski and to mountain bike and to camp and, and hike and, 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 and to just experience some of the, the, the beauties that we have here. Um, I, I am in the Department of Chemistry and Biochemistry at Brigham Young University, and um, feel free to, to, to contact me um, if you'd like. <clears throat> I, I guess I need to put up this disclaimer right here. Um, I believe that these materials are correct, and I've done my best to present them, but um, neither SVC um, nor me warrants um, this, this, this material in any way, and I've tried to obtain appropriate permissions for all of the material that's used here, or, or use it according to, to fair use in the law. Um, so now let's just get into the law now that we've um, kind of got those preliminaries out of the way. Um, why is this talk or, um, you know, why is this talk being given? What's the purpose here? And um, who is my audience? And, and this is a question I try to ask myself whenever I speak. And so as far as I can tell, my audience is people who are interested in X-ray photoelectron spectroscopy. And these may be people that really don't know very much about the technique, but are considering it or are trying to learn a little bit more about that. And so I'm assuming that we're dealing with engineers and scientists in both industry and academia, and people that you might say have surface problems, because um, these would be people that recognize that XPS is a surface technique, as we will discuss, and, and that this can provide very valuable information about surfaces. Um, now, what level of expertise is assumed here with regards to XPS? And the answer is that I'm not expecting that you have any understanding at all, although I think it would be helpful to have some science background here. So, um, you know, something like a, a BS in, in physics or chemistry or engineering. Um, if you have that kind of background, you've, you'll probably be able to understand what we, we're going to talk about here pretty well. So let's jump right in and say, what is X-ray photoelectron spectroscopy? Um, XPS, so X-ray photoelectron spectroscopy is known as XPS, and I'll probably switch back and forth between the two. Um, XPS is a technique that's based on the photoelectric effect. And this is, a, this is an effect that was um, first described by Einstein, described correctly, and he, um, I believe, got a Nobel Prize for it. But the idea is that we take a surface and we bring a source of light onto the surface. And so um, in our case, we're gonna be dealing with X-rays as that form of light. And then those, those photons, that, that light source, that light energy that hits the surface, have the ability to knock electrons out of the material. And so in a nutshell, this is all that we're talking about. <coughs> Excuse me. We're talking about X-rays in, and we're talking about photoelectrons or electrons out. That's all there is to the technique. Now, one of the things that's important in XPS is that the energies of these X-rays right here, which we could define as H nu, these energies are well known. They're measured. We know what the energy of those X-rays are. And H, of course, is Planck's constant. And nu, then, is the frequency of the light of the, of the photon right here. So what do we do in XPS? Well, what we do is we have something that's called a lens system that takes, the, takes these electrons and transports them then into something called a hemispherical analyzer. And so we have the electrons then that go through the analyzer to a detector right here. Um, and and, um, and, and, and what, what we do in this system right here with the lens and with the analyzer right here is we measure the kinetic energies of these electrons. So I know the X-ray energy right here, and I know the kinetic energies of these electrons as well. And from that, I'm able to figure out what the binding energies of those electrons are. So one of the, one of the foundational principles of science is conservation of energy. And what we say is, okay, we know the energy of the photon. We know the energy of the X-ray. And we can measure how much kinetic energy 
the, the, the electron has that's ejected from the surface. And so the rest of the energy must be the binding energy. And, and I'll say that this is approximately correct. There's, there's, there's a little correction here called the work function of the spectrometer, but that's a, real, that's, that's a pretty small correction compared to how big the kinetic energies are and how big the binding energies are of these electrons right here. And what's important is that these binding energies here that we get because we measure the kinetic energies so we can subtract them from the energy of the photon, these binding energies that we get, these identify the elements in a material. And so this is how we're able to tell you, you've got carbon or you've got titanium or you've got gold or you've got molybdenum or whatever you have on that surface. We can tell you that based on the binding energies of the photoelectrons. And, um, um, and I know I've kind of made a mess of this slide right here. So let me do a little erasing right here and say that when you're all done here, what you do is you get a spectrum and the spectrum looks something like this where we're plotting the binding energy. And so you can see down on the x-axis, we have the binding energy. And then on the, on the, on the y-axis here, we have the number of counts that we get. So this is what we plot and we get a spectrum that looks something like this. We won't talk in our presentation about why we have these rising baselines right here. You see the baselines that rise or things like that, but that would be something that you'd get in a more complete class. But what we have again is we have specific signals that are telling us what the elements are that are present at the sample, at the sample surface. Okay, so why is XPS special? Why is it unique? Or can a lot of techniques do what XPS can do? Now, one of the things to, to know first about XPS in answering this question is that the X-rays that are used in XPS can penetrate about a micron into a material. Well, that's pretty deep for a surface analysis. Um, so that's, you know, 10 to the minus six meters. That's, it doesn't sound like very much, but again, that's pretty deep for a surface. But it turns out that while the X-rays can go pretty deep into a material, the photoelectrons or the electrons that they generate can only travel about three nanometers in a solid on average before being attenuated, before losing some energy. And once those electrons start losing energy, then we've, we've lost the, the memory of those electrons. We don't know what their original energies were. And so they just kind of show up as a broad background. So the X-rays, again, they penetrate deeply and, and that wouldn't make a surface sensitive tool. But the fact that the photoelectrons can only get out of the uppermost skin, about the upper five to 10 nanometers of a surface, um, that's what makes XPS surface sensitive. So again, we're looking at the upper five to 10 nanometers of, of, of a surface. And, and again, it's not that all of the electrons lose energy after three nanometers, that's on average. So some of them go five nanometers and some even go 10 nanometers without being attenuated or without losing energy. And that's why we say again, that this technique is sensitive to the upper five to 10 nanometers of, of, of a surface. And I want to emphasize that XPS is the most widely used way of determining the compositions of surfaces. So it's not like this is an obscure technique that nobody thinks about. This really is the way that people think about the chemistries of surfaces. And, and we're gonna talk about some other reasons um, for why that is the case. It's not just that it can identify the elements, which is incredibly important, but, um, but th there's more information as well. So, um, but before going further, let's just ask the question, why does anybody care about surfaces? And, and my assumption, I guess, is that most of the people watching this video probably understand that surfaces play a really important role technologically um, and, in, and in science in general. But, but what, what do we get from surfaces? Well, surfaces are just really important in thin film deposition. And so SVC, for example, really cares about sputtering and atomic layer deposition and E-beam evaporation and thermal evaporation. All of these thin film deposition techniques are, are, are central to this society. Um, surfaces matter as well for surface wetting and corrosion and adhesion and wear and tribology and electrochemistry, um, interactions between cells and biology, all sorts of different coatings. If we're talking about an enamel or a paint, a protective coating, um, chromatography, which is something that we're quite interested in. This is separation science. That's based on surface interactions as well. And so surfaces simply show up everywhere in technology. Um, it's also worth pointing out that semiconductor devices are becoming so small with their features that are, that are uh, I believe, approaching seven nanometers, um, that, that these devices are essentially becoming all surface. So the importance of surfaces and interfaces in our, in our modern society is only increasing.
<coughs> excuse me again. So, um, so we asked the question before, you know, what else is XPS good for it? Um, it's really important to know what the elements are at a surface, but what else can XPS do? Well, it turns out that XPS is quantitative. And that's really important. Um, this means that we can tell, we, we, you know, you can do XPS and, 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 and very often you can say quantitatively how much of a particular material do you have at a surface. Again, very important information. And I do want to just as an aside say, um, the bulk of a material is not the same as the surface of a material in most cases. And so even if you know the bulk composition of a material, it's unlikely you know exactly what the surface material is, um, especially since surfaces change, they oxidize, they contaminate, et cetera, et cetera. And so um, again, if you know the bulk, um, you know, you might be surprised when you, when you take a look at the surface. Um, there's something else that's going on here. So, it's, so we have the peak heights here. So, so we might say that this is the peak height right here of this particular peak. This, particu this peak height, and it's really the area of the peak, but I guess you could go with the peak height as well. But generally, it's the peak area here that's telling you what is telling you how much of the material you have. And that's what makes XPS quantitative. In addition, there are small shifts in the positions of these peaks, and these are called chemical shifts. And these small shifts in the positions of these peaks tell you what the chemical state or the oxidation state is of the material of that element that you're talking about. So you think about everything we can get from XPS. We are getting the elemental composition. We're getting a quantitative elemental composition, and we're also getting the chemical state of the material. What's that, what, you know, what is, what, you know, what, what is it chemically? That's really powerful information, very, very useful. And very often we can do XPS to follow changes in a material. How is the chemistry? How is the composition of the surface changing? Okay, we also need to emphasize here that XPS is a core electron spectroscopy. So um, I'm assuming that a lot of people here have probably taken some chemistry. And you remember that there's a difference between valence electrons, which are the outermost electrons in an atom, and the core electrons, which are the electrons that are closer to the nucleus. Now, because those electrons are close to the nucleus, they have high binding energies. It takes a lot of energy, a lot of energy to knock them out because there are strong electro electrostatic interactions between those electrons and the nucleus. Um, and, and so to, to get, um, to be a little bit more specific, the X-rays that are usually used in XPS have quite a bit of energy compared to the energy of say the, the valence electrons. And the valence electrons are what you think about most of the time when you do chemistry. When you, when you talk about chemical bonds, you're talking about interactions between atoms through their valence electrons. But in any case, the X-rays that you use in XPS usually have about 1500 electron volts of energy or, or, or 1250 electron volts of energy. And that's, uh, d that depends on whether you're using an aluminum source or a magnesium source. So, so you make these X-rays by crashing electrons into a, into a piece of this metal and, and, and then you, you get this characteristic X-ray emission. Um, I want to emphasize that these, th this amount of energy, 1500 electron volts more or less, this is enough to knock out core electrons from atoms. And in fact, the binding energies of the, of the 1s electrons in carbon and nitrogen and oxygen and fluorine are about 285 electron volts, 400 electron vol volts, 530 electron volts, and 690 electron volts. Um, and, 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 and just in case there are some chemists here and you don't maybe have a sense for what an electron volt means, um, a good covalent bond, so maybe something like a carbon-hydrogen bond, the strength of that bond is going to be more or less four electron volts. So, so again, this gives you the sense, well, and, and, and we know that a carbon-hydrogen bond is a pretty good bond. Um, you know, they're, you know, polyethylene that you saran wrap, um, it's, it's a pretty stable material. Those, those, those carbon-hydrogen bonds are intact and don't go anywhere. So again, four electron volts is a pretty strong um, covalent bond, and yet we're dealing with, you know, 1,500 or 1,250 electron volts of energy in the X-ray, and then the amount of energy needed to remove the, an electron from a s orbital in these different elements right here is you know somewhere between about 300 to 700 electron volts so so again that's a lot of energy compared to the energy in a covalent bond okay so one question again you might be asking if you're if you're just trying to get a sense for this technique is this 
is XBS becoming more important or less important? And it turns out that it's a growing technique. In fact, it's growing very, very well. Um, approximately 150 instruments are sold each year. Well, that might not sound like very many compared to the, the number of HPLCs or something like that, or GCs that are sold each year. Um, but that's, that's, that's allowing the technique to grow very, very well. And you should also consider that each of those 150 instruments, more or less, cost between half a million dollars and, and one and a half million dollars. So these are expensive pieces of equipment. And we're going to look at some of this equipment in just a minute. Um, there's also been a steady and significant increase in the number of papers that are mentioning XPS every year. In fact, that's a little bit of a problem, as we're going to see later in this presentation. I mean, in fact, um, the number of or the increase in the number of papers being published is increasing at about one and a half times the rate of the of the number of of, of the increase in publications in general. So 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 you know you you might say well okay so so you say that you know the number of citations and the number of mentions in the literature that XPS is getting is increasing. Well well but the number of papers out there is increasing as well. Well XPS um, the, 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 you know, the, the use of the technique appears to be increasing about one and a half times as fast as, as the rate of all the other papers um, that are being published and all that. So, so XPS really is um, increasing um, in importance and, and doing so in a, in a very nice way. Um, this figure right here, which isn't quite up to date, but, it's, but, but the trends have continued, um, shows the number of citations that we get from XPS, which is growing at a, at a very nice clip. And we compare that to OG electron spectroscopy, which, which truly is important, important. And also time of flight secondary ion mass spectrometry or just SIMS in general. And, and, and the number of papers mentioning SIMS is increasing and it's increasing nicely. And, and with OJ, OJ, there appears to be an increase as well. Surfaces matter, surfaces are becoming more important. People need multiple techniques to, to, to look at their surfaces, but XPS is really increasing very, very nicely as we can see in this trend right here. So why are the XPS instruments so expensive? Um, why, why do they cost half a million dollars or one and a half million dollars? <clears throat> And the answer is that an XPS is a complex piece of instrumentation. Um, there will be multiple stainless steel chambers here. This is, this is a picture of an XPS right here. And you can see a lot of stainless steel right here. So multiple stainless steel chambers right here, multiple vacuum pumps. The vacuum pumps can be expensive. Usually the vacuum pumps are held down here. Um, lots of stainless steel flanges and tubing. So all over the place here, again, we've got stainless steel fl um, flanges with copper gaskets holding everything together, different pieces of tubing. We're gonna have both X-ray and electron guns here. We're gonna have the electron transfer lens that we talked about. We're gonna have an electron spectrometer. The electron spectrometer is shown right here at the top and there will be a detector um, um, at the end of it. There will be transfer arms to move samples around. There will be racks of electronics. Those are not shown here. The whole thing will be computer controlled with advanced software. And not only that, it's very common to either couple an XPS to other instruments or to actually bolt other instruments onto it, such as ion scattering spectroscopy, um, ultraviolet photoelectron spectroscopy, Raman, et cetera. So one of the trends in XPS is to actually include other techniques on an XPS, but of course that adds to the expense and the complexity of the instrument as well. So, so there's a lot here in an XPS. Um, and, and I do want to emphasize, though, that, um, again, I, I, I don't, I, 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 this may seem a little bit daunting to, to, to see this much instrumentation, this much, this much hardware here. Um, but with this complexity comes a great deal of power. And, and I think, we, um, I, you know, I tried to emphasize some of the, the really cool things that XPS can do. And I should emphasize that there's even more that you can get out of the technique. Um, here's another um, picture of an XPS system. And... Um, Again, just, just um, a complicated piece of equipment. You know, here I see a transfer arm, and here I see the hemispherical analyzer for analyzing the electrons. This looks like a big vacuum chamber right here. This would be another chamber right here. There are lots of windows right here so that people can see what they're doing. Um, pumps would be down here, probably with power supplies, um, et cetera, et cetera. I can see what look like vacuum gauges right here. Um, lots of, lots of, lots of tubes and wires. 
complicated piece of equipment. Um, this particular system um, has UPS, ultraviolet photoelectron spectroscopy capability. So again, that's a sister technique, not as important as XPS, but, but, but a good niche technique. It has an ion gun for ablating the surface. Um, it has a side cha chamber for doing other things. Um, again, that's not at all uncommon to, to couple an XPS with other systems, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so let's see. Um, you mentioned vacuum pumps. Is XPS a vacuum technique? What types of pressures are required and what restrictions does this place on samples? So those might be questions that came up in your mind as you, as, as, as you heard about um, to, um, XPS so far. So um, XPS is a vacuum technique traditionally. And I should say that there's a, a new way of doing XPS we'll talk about in a few minutes that, um, that, that allows the technique to be done at a much higher pressure, a pressure that's much closer to atmospheric pressure. But traditionally, XPS has been done under high vacuum. And those pressures tend to be truly, again, ultra high vacuum, 10 to the minus 8 to 10 to the minus 10 tor. Um, and, and so why would people do that? Because it's obviously... Um, it's expensive and, and, and it requires, you know, a fair amount of hardware to get to those um, types of pressures. I mean, unless you want to work on the space shuttle and you want to work um, in outer space, but that's not really feasible. Um, so one of the reasons to have a low pressure is that this allows photoelectrons to get to the detector. So the, the photoelectrons have to be able to go, they, 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 they can't go through the air. If, if, you, if you try to send an electron through the air, it doesn't go very far. Um, it just runs into the molecules in the air and, 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 and that's it. Um, and so we need a vacuum so that these photoelectrons, and again, this is a photoelectron spectroscopy. This technique depends on measuring photoelectrons. We've got to have a vacuum so that those photoelectrons can, can be transported so that they can fly to the detector. Now, now it turns out that 10 to the minus 4 tor would probably be good enough. It, it really does suffice. Um, and, and so you might say, okay, well, we, we need some vacuum. Why do we go to such a high vacuum? Um, another reason for having such a good vacuum is that it does keep samples clean. And um, when XPS was originally done, this is now looking back decades, uh, many of the practitioners of the technique um, were surface scientists, and they wanted really, really clean pieces of metal so they could study catalysis, and they could study those 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 those, those, those metal those those metal surfaces. Um, um, again, in their absolutely pristine state. And so having an ultra high vacuum environment was necessary for their studies. And that's one of the reasons, so it's a historical reason that um, XPS is done under vacuum, under ultra high vacuum. Um, in addition, some of the components of the, of, of, of the XPS system, um, like micro channel plates, often need to be held under vacuum so that they can be kept in, a, in, in the state that, 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 that they need to be in. So these are some of the reasons why XPS is done under vacuum. And again, the typical pressures that, that, that you will find in a, in a standalone traditional XPS instrument. Um, what this means is that samples must be vacuum compatible. This means that you, you can't put a piece of garbage in the XPS if it's going to outgas and it's going to ruin your vacuum. It also means that sample handling matters. These are, again, topics that would come up in a more advanced class. Um, you know, what types of samples are vacuum compatible? And it turns out that there are a lot of samples that you can just put into an XPS. But, but something like, you know, a piece of cheese or a grape, um, you know, not a good idea. Um, that's really going to mess up your vacuum. So, so most biological samples would need a lot of very special preparation if you're going to do conventional XPS on them. And this also means, again, that sample handling uh, matters a great deal. Um, a fingerprint or a smudge um, can be enough to ruin a vacuum. So, so you have to be quite careful with the vacuum. So um, before we go into a few more details about XPS, I did want to say what are some of the advantages and some, of, some additional features of XPS? So, so here, here's a list of advantages. Um, XPS is sensitive to all the elements except hydrogen and helium. And so um, with XPS, you can see everything from lithium to uranium, which is, which is really quite remarkable. So essentially, you can see everything on the periodic table. The inability to see helium is not a big deal because it's not like, you know, helium shows up hardly ever in samples. But the inability to see hydrogen is an issue. And, um, and it would be, of course, nice if you, if you could see hydrogen, but, but you, have, you have the rest of the periodic table. And I should say that not only does XPS see the core electrons of materials, it also allows you to see the valence bands of materials. And hydrogen strongly influences the valence bands of, of materials. So very often you get a sense for what's going on with the hydrogen, even though you don't see it directly. 
Um, as I mentioned, XPS provides chemical state information, you might say speciation of the elements there. What oxidation states are present? Well, XPS can give that to you, and it can do it quantitatively. Very powerful information. As I, okay, here it is, it's quantitative. XPS is a quantitative tool. Um, XPS is really quite widely available. Um, lots of universities, many large companies, many surface analysis um, houses, they have XPS instruments. Um, XPS is extremely well accepted. If you tell somebody, I'm going to go do an XPS analysis, everybody understands that's a, a very well established technique. Um, you're, you, you know, again, you're not going to get any pushback of people saying, why are you using that strange niche technique? You know, it, it's not like it's unproven. XPS is really standard and well accepted. Um, and because XPS is well accepted, there's now a large number of reference spectra that are available um, at places like Surface Science Spectra, which is an AVS journal. Um, eSpectra through AIP is, is another nice place to access a lot of spectra. Um, um, Paul Pygram down at, um, at La Trobe University in Australia put together a really nice database with a lot of XPS spectra. Um, Mark Greiner um, it, 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 um, Max Planck Institute in, in, in Germany has similarly put together, um, is putting together some, 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 some reference material. Vince Christ is doing that. So there are a lot of people out there that are, that are putting out this information. And, um, and this can be very, very helpful when you take spectra, um, because then you can go and compare what you've done to what's out there. In some cases, the spectra are pretty simple. So um, in, in some important way, you know, for some important materials, you can get fairly simple XPS spectra, which is helpful. Um, I should say that, um, unfortunately, sometimes they're deceptively simple, and there's a lot of bad peak fitting out there, but we're going to get to that in this presentation. Um, detection limits are actually pretty good, about 0.1 to 1% of a monolayer of material. Um, this is not as good as for something like secondary ion mass spectrometry, TOF SIMS, um, but these are still pretty good detection limits, so you can have a pretty good sense for what's on your surface. As I mentioned, you also see the valence bands of materials, and XPS is amenable to a lot of different types of samples. There really are a lot of samples that are UHV compatible, lots of different polymers, lots of different metals, et cetera. Um, lots of semiconductors can, can be put into an XPS directly. Really, you just put it into the prep chamber, pump it down, and then put it into the analytical chamber. And many more can be analyzed with a technique called near ambient pressure X-ray photoelectron spectroscopy. So we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, you can do sample imaging and mapping. It's not terribly fast, but certainly you can make maps of your surface. And both conducting and insulating samples can be analyzed. How you analyze an insulating sample and the way you have to do the charge compensation, that would be a topic for, uh, for um, a more complete course on this topic. Well, before going any further, um, I think it's also fair to say that XPS has some disadvantages, and these ought to be acknowledged as well. Um, there's limited molecular information in XPS. You get the elemental composition, you get the oxidation states, the, um, the, 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 that, that, that chemical speciation. But in terms of molecular information, you know, what type of molecular fragment do I have on the surface? That's really hard to get with XPS. And, and a technique like time of flight SIMS usually gives a lot more molecular information. In fact, there's a reason why XPS and time of flight SIMS are often used hand in hand in, ma in many experiments. Um, XPS doesn't allow you to differentiate between isotopes. Mass spectrometry obviously does. As I mentioned, um, XPS is, the, the instrumentation is just expensive. Um, plan on putting out half a million dollars, million dollars, $1.5 million. And I should also say it's not free to maintain. Um, it'll probably cost you $30,000, $50,000 a year to maintain your instrument. Um, and in spite of what some mac manufacturers may imply, um, spectral analysis and peak fitting requires some training and practice. In fact, we're going to get to this a little bit later, as I mentioned. Um, the fact is that um, while some spectra are relatively simple, a lot of them are pretty complex, and it does require um, a little bit of skill and training um, to learn how to uh, interpret the spectra. Now, the good news is that really anybody can learn how to do this, um, but, but, um, but it does require some training and some focus. Um, the best lateral resolution in terms of the imaging is only about 1 to 10 microns, depending on the instrument, um, which is not phenomenal compared to something like time of flight SIMS. With time of flight SIMS, you can image, um, the, your, your, your resolution is below a micron. 
Um, there are a lot of samples that are not UHV compatible, many liquids, gases, polymers, et cetera. Um, just simply, you can't put into an ultra high vacuum. You can't, put a you can't put water, you can't put a biological solution into an XPS. Again, we'll talk about NAP XPS in a few minutes um, and how that's um, really expanding the range of possibilities for the technique. And, and analyses can be a, a little on the slow side. So again, TOF SIMS, TOF SIMS is just a faster technique in general. Um, with XPS, in terms of um, you know, the pump down and everything like that, you're looking about it, you know, at an hour to get some data. Although once again, NAPXPS is, 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 really, um, is really making a difference there. Okay, so I keep mentioning this near ambient pressure X-ray photoelectron spectroscopy, this NAP, this NAPXPS. Um, and, I, and I really think this is an exciting new development of the technique. Um, in NAPX, NAPXPS, you use differential pumping so that your spectra, so that your sample can be at about 25 tor. And so instead of being at 10 to the minus eight to 10 to the minus 10 tor, you're not that far from atmospheric pressure. And that dramatically increases the, the, the number and possibility of samples that you can put in. This right here is a standalone instrument um, from Specs. They're located in Berlin, Germany. This is actually really big. So, you know, I would probably stand about this tall next to the instrument. So it's, 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 so it's really big. You can see the hemispherical analyzer just a little bit. Here's a column that the x-rays go up. Um, but, but really a remarkable piece of equipment right here. Um, and, and again, what this does is it allows many more samples to be considered for XPS and it lets the analysis be really fast. Since you don't have to pump down very much, um, you can put in a sample and, and have data within three or four minutes. Really remarkable. And we recently published a series of papers on this technique with specs um, in surface science spectra. And here's some of the materials that we analyzed. And again, most of these would be challenging, if not impossible, to analyze by conventional XPS. An Italian cheese, human hair, paper, a zeolite, various polymers, an old Roman coin, a human tooth, DMSO, yeah, like the solvent, the liquid, various gases. So you can just bleed different gases into the analytical chamber. And we, we got the spectra of air and argon and nitrogen and oxygen, liquid water. Yes, we did Coca-Cola as well, um, a kidney stone and more. Um, so anyway, I'll refer you to Surface Science Spectra if you want to look up those papers. Um, another advantage of XPS, so let's get back to um, XPS and its advantages, is that um, electrons are convenient to work with. And um, why is that? Well, el electrons um, are easily manipulated with electric fields, and they're easy to detect. Um, in general, and they, um, quote, disappear when you measure them. So um, it's not like you, you, you have a pile of electrons done, um, or you, you have a pile of electrons you have to deal with when you're done. Um, that's, that's just not a problem with the technique. Again, you don't have to clean up the electrons and, and throw, them away or, uh, throw them away or anything like that. Okay, so how does the electron analysis system work in an XPS. And, and I kind of drew a picture of this before. And so let's imagine that I have my sample down here and I have my X-rays coming in. So here are my X-rays and my X-rays generate photoelectrons right here. And these electrons then go up this lens system and, 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 and then they go into a hemispherical analyzer. And you'll notice that I have a negative potential on this upper hemisphere right here. So this is the upper hemisphere. And then I have a lower hemisphere that has a more positive potential right here. And as a result, this causes the electrons to bend around and come to a detector. It also turns out that only electrons with just the right energy are able to make it through this detector. And the way to, um, people typically do XPS is they leave this voltage and this voltage fixed. And what they do is they use the lens system to allow the electrons with different kinetic energies to go sequentially through this, this, um, th this spectrometer right here. And so what the lens system is doing is it's allowing electrons with certain kinetic energies, it's allowing only certain electrons to pass through the spectrometer. And I'm using the word pass deliberately because the energy of an electron that will, the, the, the right energy that, let, that, let, that lets this electron pass through the spectrometer is called the pass energy. Um, and, and, and so what I do again is I scan the voltages here, I'm allowing all the different electrons here with different kinetic energies to go through my system. And that's what generates the spectrum that we've been seeing. So um, let's see if we go back, we can see, yeah. So this is the type of spectrum that we generate 
And this is how we would have gotten a spectrum um, like this again, is by scanning the, 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 the is, is, is by scanning the lens system and letting the, the electrons go through one after another um, by energy and then generating something like this. Okay, so, um, so let's now talk about chemical shifts. And uh, so chemical shifts are just really important. Um, and, and we mentioned these before, the chemical shifts are, 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 are what gives, um, they tell you what the oxidation states are of the elements. This is what allows you to do chemical speciation. Um, and, 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 and again, um, this, this is so important. If, if, if all XPS did was give you elemental information, it would be important. But this additional information of, of the chemical environment, the chemical state, the oxidation state of an element is just crucial in so many ways. Um, and all of this is, it, it comes about because the bonding environment of an atom influences the binding energies of its photoelectrons. And we're gonna talk about this a little bit more in the next slide or two. It turns out that, <coughs> excuse me, the chemical shifts are relatively small, but significant and very measurable. And when I say small, chemical shifts um, for something like carbon are, are, are vary from about you know, zero to 10 electron volts. So, so again, very, very measurable shifts, but, but relatively small you know, compared to how big the energies are you know, com compared to what the binding energy is of the carbon 1s electron, or, which was 285 electron volts, or the energy of the photon, the X-ray that's impinging on the surface. In any case, because of different bonding environments for elements, we get shifts in the binding energies of those electrons, and those are the chemical shifts. Um, and these, again, tell us about the oxidation states of the elements. And let's give an example right here. Um, and, and this is a really common example. So what we're talking about is we're talking about a silicon wafer that has a, a little bit of native oxide on top of it. So, um, so Many of us have worked with silicon wafers. They're shiny. They kind of have a have a gray metallic luster to them. Um, and a silicon wafer will, in general, have a very thin layer of, of native oxide on top of it. You can measure this by ellipsometry, and it's about 1.5 nanometers thick. That's a, a typical number for this oxide layer. And what I've tried to do here is I've tried to represent the bulk silicon. So what's down here? The bulk. In, in, in this way right here. And what I'm showing is that every silicon atom is bonded to four other silicon atoms. And of course, this would be in a tetrahedron and all that. So we're, we're just looking at it in the plane. And then we're representing what's at the surface of the silicon right here as SiO2. And this would be silicon bonded to four oxygens right here. So, so again, this is kind of a chemical representation of what we have. And of course, there would be a tetrahedron as well. This would be in three dimensions as well. Okay, so I think the thing to notice here is that this silicon atom right here and this silicon atom are in very different chemical states. This silicon atom right here on the left, it's bonded just to other silicon atoms. And so I would expect these bonds here. So I have these covalent bonds. Here's a covalent bond. Here's a covalent bond. I have all these covalent bonds, these silicon-silicon bonds. If I have identical silicon atoms, then I, I don't have any, the, the, the bonds aren't polarized. Then, then the electrons aren't, 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 aren't shifted towards one atom or another. The electrons are evenly shared between the silicon atoms. But that's not the case over here on the right. Um, oxygen is simply more electronegative than silicon. In fact, oxygen is the second most electronegative element after fluorine. And so because oxygen is so electronegative, I get electron withdrawal or deshielding is another way to um, look at this, but I get electron withdrawal, withdrawal from this silicon. The oxygen atoms pull electrons away from the silicon that deshields the, 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 the electrons that are there. That means that the core electrons that are left feel the nuclear charge. They, they, they have, they're, they're in more direct, they, 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 they have a more direct attraction to the nucleus. And so the binding energies of the core electrons in this silicon atom are higher than in this silicon atom because of the chemical environment that the silicon is in. Okay, so how does that play out in XPS? If I look at the bulk silicon, I see a signal like this, okay? So what's called the silicon 2p peak, that means I'm knocking out 2p electrons, um, that shows up about 99 electron volts. Whereas if I have silicon oxide right here, 
I see a peak at about 103 electron volts. And so this is a very nice way of seeing whether or not I have oxide on silicon. If I don't have this peak, if that peak were to go away, then that would tell me that I had an oxide-free surface. So I think we've talked through this. Um, here's a little explanation of, of, of what's going on here in this picture. Okay, so, so how does this play out? Well, um, um, as I've mentioned, XPS has been used to analyze lots of, of important materials, including a lot of polymers. And uh, this, is, this is an important polymer right here. This one is called polyethylene terephthalate. Most of us are wearing some polyethylene terephthalate. This is the polyester in the clothes that we wear. So, so most of us are wearing a cotton poly mixture. I'm sure that this shirt that I'm wearing right now is probably a, a, a cotton poly mix. Okay, so we just talked about chemical shifts. And um, if we go in and we look at this structure of PET, and I apologize to you, that, those of you that aren't chemists, but this right here shows the structure of PET. So I have an aromatic ring right here. And, and, and so this means a carbon and a carbon. So right here, I've just got carbon bonded to carbon. But this carbon right here, notice that it's bonded to an oxygen right here. It's bonded to this oxygen right here through a double bond and another oxygen here. And, and again, just remembering what we just saw, we saw that when silicon was bonded to oxygen, that oxygen pulls away those electrons from, from, from the silicon and it raises the binding energy um, of, 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 of the electrons coming out of that silicon. Well, the same thing happens here. Here I'm looking at the carbon 1s spectrum. And if I look at, say, these electrons right here that are coming from the aromatic ring, then I would find that these would be down here. That would be this big peak right here. But this carbon right here that's bonded to all this oxygen, it shows up right here. And then you notice that I have a carbon right here. That's a carbon. And it's bonded to this oxygen right here. Then that would show up down here. So, 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 so as I put more and more oxygen on a carbon, I shift those energies um, to higher, I shift the, the binding energies of, 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 the, of, the, of, of those electrons to, to higher and higher, um, to, to higher and higher energies. So again, binding energies um, become greater as I put more oxygen around a carbon. And that's just again, for because of this inductive effect, the, 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 those oxygens are, are withdrawing electron density and deshielding those carbons. Okay, and, and in fact, this, 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 this whole thing with carbon and oxygen and whether I have one bond through an alcohol or maybe two bonds through, 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 through an aldehyde or a ketone or three carbon oxygen bonds through, through a carboxyl group, this is all really well understood. And it turns out that every time you add an oxygen onto your carbon, you shift the binding energy of that carbon by about plus 1.2 to plus 1.5 EV, where it gets greater, the binding energy increases. Um, and, and this is really very valuable information. If I were to put a sample into my spectrometer and I didn't see this peak, for example, this wasn't there, then I would be able to say, well, I, I don't have a structure like this on my surface. So, so there can be um, some, some good chemical information that comes out of XPS. And again, um, there very often is. Um, and, um, oh, okay, so, so ignore that comment. That doesn't need to be there. Um, th this spectrum is actually not plotted backwards. I'm sorry, I had a different spectrum um, here originally. So this one's actually okay. Um, you do plot binding energy um, going to the, 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 um, the, the left. Although, let me back up and say, this one is plotted backwards. And I apologize for that. So this one should have been plotted the other way. This, this is this is not the, that this is not that huge of a deal, um, but but there is a convention that says binding energy should be plotted increasing to the left. Okay, um, so so what all of this means, and and this is going this would be a topic for a, for a more um, a more complete course. But what 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 we're seeing right here is that in a material like PET polyethylene terephthalate. Um, and, and I believe also that mylar, for example, is just, I think is biaxially oriented, just kind of rolled PET. So, so again, this shows up all over the place. But the bottom line is that because I have different chemical states for carbon, different oxidation states, one here and one here we just talked about. And actually this one right here is, is shifted because of the presence of, of that carbon. And then these right here, because I have these different peaks, I end up with a bunch of overlapping peaks here. It turns out that in XPS, um, peak widths um, of these peaks that I see right here are usually about 0.5 to 2 EV wide. 
But the chemical shifts that we're talking about, I, you know, I mentioned that for carbon, they can go from zero to 10 EV, um, but very often they appear, you know, kind of from zero to five EV. And so I have peaks that are one and a half to two EV, typically wide, being shifted by more or less that same amount. And as a result, I just have a lot of overlapping peaks. And so that means that peak fitting um, is, is, is really a necessary exercise if you're going to extract chemical information from XPS. And unfortunately, as we're about to see in this presentation, it's often done wrong. Okay, so, um, and, 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 and again, I emphasize that in many molecules, um, a, 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 a given element appears in multiple oxidation state, states. That's certainly the case here with PET, and PET is not an exception. It's not at all unusual, again, to see a, a polymer or a metal sample where you have both oxide and reduced, like in a metal sample or a semiconductor, you have both the oxide and the reduced material, et cetera. Um, here's just another quick example <coughs> of a chemical shift in XPS, and this is of an ester group. So, so let's remember our organic chemistry. And remember, what does an ester group look like? So, so I might have some carbon here and some carbon here, and there'd be other stuff on this carbon, of course, like this. Um, but it turns out that in this ester group, we can see two oxygens. And if you look at the oxygen 1S spectrum, which is what's shown here, you see two very nice peaks, and these peaks basically have the same area. And in fact, they correspond to the two oxygens here. And, and we could talk later, um, or again, in, in, a, in a more complete class about which, which peak corresponds to which oxygen. In fact, the way you can figure this out, remember, is just draw this resonance structure um, for, for the ester, and then it becomes pretty clear what's going on. Okay, so again, this is, this is now the oxygen 1S spectrum that corresponds to the C1S spectrum that we just looked at. Um, these are actually from different materials, but it's, it's, it's it, you know, you, you, would, you, would, you would very often, again, take a carbon 1S spectrum and an oxygen 1S spectrum, and then you would see complementary information um, in, both, um, in, in both of these. Okay, so um, this brings us now to a rather important topic, and, and that is, I, I, I want to give you kind of um, a sense of, of what's going on in the field right now. Um, is XPS becoming more important? Yes, very much more important. But, but there's been kind of, um, there's, uh, there's been a problem associated with that. And that is that, as, as I think I mentioned, about 30 years ago, XPS was done by a bunch of, of really talented people. And it was only done by a few people. Um, and, and so they really specialized on the technique and they really got it right. But as XPS has become more and more important, lots of people have been using it. And what the experts in the field have been finding is that there's simply a lot of um, incorrect data analysis that's appearing in the literature. And in fact, it's, 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 it's fairly bad right now. Um, so this is another reason to learn a little bit more about XPS. And I will repeat, much of the XPS peak fitting and data analysis in the scientific literature is simply wrong. And um, what we did is, um, not too long ago, in fact, it's actually earlier this year, I believe, um, we, um, we gathered a whole bunch of the world's experts and we wrote an open letter on the problem. So this is me right here. And then this is a whole bunch of other world experts in XPS. And, and the topic of this letter that we wrote was the proliferation of faulty materials data analysis in the literature. The problem isn't just with XPS. In fact, this is a little plug for all of the, the, the seminars that would be given by, all of the short courses that would be given by SVC. It's really kind of important to learn about the techniques because um, the, the, the material characterization techniques that are out there because a lot of them are being misapplied. Um, so again, at least this group of experts right here agrees that the problem is quite significant. Well, um, so, so how bad are things really? Um, well, um, um, I, 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 th th you can look this paper up. So you've, you've got the citation right here. Um, I, I deliberately left off the author's names, but if you go and you look at this paper, and I will just draw it here because I, I, I didn't really want to embarrass them by showing the data. But if you look at what they've done is they have a spectrum that kind of looks like this, and they go in and they label all of these noise, these little bits of noise as different chemical states. Um, this is really just nonsense. In fact, they do it twice in their paper. They have another spectrum that kind of looks like this, where there's just natural noise on it. And you can see what the peaks would look like. They're, like there'd be a real peak here, there'd be a real peak here, probably something like this. But they've taken, they've taken the little bits of noise. So if I were to draw this spectrum again, they, they, they've got something like this. They've taken these little bits of noise on, on, on their spectra, and they've labeled them as different chemical states. 
this is completely wrong. Um, so again, I don't want to mention them by name. And, and again, you can look up the references if, if you'd like it. This is what you'll find. Here's another common error that's mentioned in the literature. <clears throat> in a more complete course, we would talk about something called spin orbit splitting. It turns out that S or, or the, the, the peaks that you get from S orbitals in XPS, um, these, these, these signals always are one peak. But when you get a signal from a P or a D or an F orbital, these always come in, in, in two peaks. And in fact, these, these peaks have a well-defined ratio. You have a two to one ratio for P signal signals, and you have a three to two ratio for a D signal, and you have a four to three ratio for an F signal. And this is an example of a narrow scan of the sulfur 2P peak. So, so I kind of ignored it before when we talked about silicon. It turns out that that spin orbit splitting, those peaks are really, really close together. So you don't see it very well. But by the time you get to silicon, what you see is this. And you might say, wait, well, you've got two peaks. Doesn't that mean you have two chemical states? No, this is one chemical state because of this spin orbit splitting, as it's called. So this is just one chemical state right here. <coughs> <clears throat> um, excuse me. And, and again, I would find that there's a two to one ratio here, and I would find that this, this difference in energy is well defined here. So this is what you always have to have when you have this spin orbit splitting. I um, mean, here are a few more details of this fit right here, the type of background that was, that was used, et cetera, et cetera. Um, well, um, I, I deliberately, again, didn't show this data right here. Here's a paper from Nature Communications. It has been cited about 750 times. If you go in and you look at figure four, so I will tell you it is figure four, and you, and, and you look at the sulfur 2P fitting, these authors have completely ignored all of the spin orbit splitting, which means their analysis is completely wrong. And if I were actually to draw another mistake, because people, when they make mistakes, they usually make multiple stakes. So they have these, these peak envelopes or whatever. And what they did is they put very narrow peaks and very broad peaks into the same spectrum. Again, there was, they, they completely ignored the spin orbit splitting, but they, they have very narrow and very broad peaks all over the place. And this usually doesn't happen in XPS either. I think they often, they also truncated their data a little bit um, as well, which is, which is not good. Um, and, 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 but that, that would be a, a more minor error. But there were, we would have to say, catastrophic errors in this paper right here. These analyses are completely wrong for the reasons that I just mentioned. Um, if you go to PhysRev letters, again, we are mercifully not showing the data, but I will kind of just draw, there's something that kind of looks like this, and, or, or actually it's not quite as well. Um, okay, well, there was this great big peak, and then the authors have a little tiny peak next to it. Again, wide peak width, narrow peak width, this just doesn't happen. Um, and I think this was for an oxygen 1S spectrum right here. So again, I'm just trying to draw and be merciful to the authors um, and, and not show their real data. Um, another thing that you kind of find in the literature is, is what will happen is people will compare materials to each other. So they'll take XPS spectra of a similar of a set of materials. And so here's a peak envelope and here's a peak envelope and here's a peak envelope. But what they'll sometimes do is they'll say, well, here's a chemical state here with this peak. And now they'll say that the same chemical state is supposed to be this one right here. Well, the peak widths don't change and the positions don't change. And, um, and, 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 and this, this, this paper, I'm not even gonna tell, you know, I'm, I'm, I haven't given you a citation for it, but, but, but yes, these, these people have this type of thing all over the place where they have narrow peaks and broad peaks, which they shouldn't have. And then these peaks vary all over the place between these spectra. Okay, so um, our question was, um, you know, okay, well, um, let, let's, back, uh, let's, let's back up a bit. Once again, why is there a problem with the XPS data analysis in the literature? And was there always a problem? And once again, decades ago, the surface analysis was mostly done by this small community of experts. Um, but now it seems like everybody's using XPS, but people just aren't really using it right. Um, and in fact, most XPS is now being done by non-experts. And, and in fact, the tables have flipped, I think, about 95% of what's in the literature is XPS that's shown by people that are not part of surface analysis groups. Um, unfortunately, it looks like the world is not producing enough highly trained experts to go with those 150 um, instruments that are being sold each year. They, they're, they're put at a university and, and, and people can um, 
you know, and, and people can just go up and use them and get the data. And then again, very often um, the data are misinterpreted. And one of the problems that we're faced with is that more and more of the data, um, more and more of the analyses in the literature are incorrect. So people are using those incorrect analyses as precedent from their work. Well, this is Don Bayer right here. This is my friend Don Bayer, and he's worked at PNNL for many years, and he just retired. And he recommended that the community of XPS experts write a series of guides on this topic to help with the problem. And 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 so um, we have participated in the writing of these guides, and and, and they've they've just been appearing this year. Um, but one of the things that nobody had really done is nobody had measured the size of the problem. How bad was it really? So um, the the different experts, we would go to conferences, and and um, you know we would show each other these bad spectra that we would see in the literature, and we see them all the time. Um, so it's not like it's hard to find them. Um, and 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 we'd all look at them and just kind of shake our heads and say, you know, you know, this is, you know, this is, this is awful or whatever, but nobody had actually measured the problem. And so we decided to measure it. And what we did is we formed an ad hoc committee of other experts. So we took Don, so this is Don right here, um, over here. And then we took Thomas Gegenbach, Gegenbach, and we took Chris Easton. I don't have a picture for Chris and Bill Skinner from, uh, these two guys are from Australia, um, Don is from PNNL. And we worked with Alberto Herrera Gomez, who's from Mexico. And um, these are all really good XPS experts. And what we did is we evaluated all the XPS spectra that are shown in three high quality journals over a six month period of time. So there were 407 papers that we found that actually showed XPS spectra. 63% of these showed XPS peak fitting. So we've shown some of this XPS peak fitting that's done. And we graded the papers. We said, well, they're either green if they have no errors or very minor errors, or they're yellow if they only have minor issues associated with them. That might mean that they like plotted the data backwards as I, as I did earlier um, in one of these spectra that, that um, is, is many years old from our group. Um, or we might have orange errors where things are getting pretty bad or red errors that are pretty much just catastrophic. But this was our classification scheme. And um, what we did is each of the five members, so it was me and then the other people here. Um, oh, I, yeah, I, I guess, okay, so there were six of us, um, but, but five members, five panel members initially evaluated all of the spectra. So I, <coughs> I did this with my graduate students, and again, Don did this, and Thomas did this, and Chris did this, not shown, and then and Bill did this as well. And again, we, we graded every spectrum that we could find in the literature. It turns out that 60% of the time we all agreed. In 33% more of those cases, we agreed to within one category. We might have been off, you know, whether it was green or yellow or, you know, orange or red or whatever. Only in 7% of the time, only 7% of the time did we disagree by more than one category. And then when we were done, we sent all of this information to Alberto right here. We made him our judge and we said, Alberto, you know, take a careful look at everything that we've done and make sure that we haven't gone overboard and giving too many, you know, bad ratings or whatever. Make sure that we've actually been careful and, and sensible. And um, uh, I should say that Alberto agreed with this very well, um, although he did recommend that a few of our orange rankings should become red. Okay, now um, I don't think that I really have the time here to talk about all of these errors. Well, actually, maybe maybe we do have a little bit of time. Um, so again, if if a paper got a green rating, that meant that it was just a really good paper, um, or or I should say that the spectra were really good because we looked at the spectra there. No significant errors, maybe a few minor little things here and there, including plotting backwards. That was something that we really didn't ding people for. That wasn't that that huge of a, of a deal. If a paper got a yellow rating, that sometimes meant there was a little bit of truncation of the data. Um, when you take XPS data, you really need to take some of the background on the edges of the peak. And so that was often missing. Um, sometimes people would show the fit components. That is, they'd put in the fit peaks that we, you've, you've seen some of this peak fitting, <coughs> but they wouldn't show the sum of that so that you couldn't compare that to the overall peak envelope. But we could see that the fit was pretty good. Things were pretty sensible. So they got a yellow rating, but yellow means pretty good as well. We're not too concerned about yellow ratings. Um, sometimes people didn't show the background or a baseline for the fit, but the background that they implied through the peaks that they put in, um, that, that was all pretty sound. And, and so we could tell that they had done a pretty good job there. Um, and, and there may have been some concerns about where they put the baseline. So, so when I talk about a baseline, so you've got a spectrum right here, 
And in XPS, I, I, I mentioned before that often you get a rising baseline. And so it's important to figure out where to put that baseline. And that's what we're talking about here. It's also important to know what type of baseline to put in. And so sometimes people will um, maybe not put the baseline exactly where it should be with regards to the noise on either side of the peak. So maybe there were some minor issues there. One of the reasons I'm going through these issues is it gives you a flavor for some of the key issues that are associated with XPS, <coughs> with XPS peak fitting, which again is so important for extracting that chemical information from the technique. And this also gives you a sense for the type of topics that would be covered in more detail in a more complete class. Okay, so what if we have an orange um, rating? What did that mean? Um, sometimes it meant significant truncation of the peak envelope. So, you know, instead of seeing the whole peak and, and, you know, some noise on either side, maybe what they did is they just started taking data like right here. And, 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 and so they cut off this portion of the spectrum. That's really bad because it's hard to do good peak fitting if you don't, if you don't see this, this baseline, this noise on either side of the peak and know where that baseline is. Um, often they, didn't they did not include the sum of the fit components. So again, we might have some fit components in here, um, but, but they would get an orange ranking if we could see that these fit components, you can just see they really don't add up to the peak envelope. Um, they're not a good approximation of it. Sometimes, um, sometimes um, there are backgrounds that you can identify as just being incorrect. And sometimes people use, you know, really bad, um, really bad backgrounds. An example would be when you have a big step in the background, and again, this is pretty common, you need to use a, a background called a, either a Shirley background or a two guard background. But sometimes people would just put a straight line there. And yes, sometimes their backgrounds would just cut through the data as well. And so, so these were errors that we would observe as well. Um, and, 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 and in some cases, they would, they would, they would, the background wouldn't even match the noise. They would like have the background up here or something like that. Sorry for chuckling a little bit. <clears throat> but the background would almost have nothing to do with the data. Um, these were real problems. Um, as I mentioned before, it's very rare in XPS, or at least fairly rare, that you have really big differences in peak widths. Now, one exception to that is when you have a metal, you often have narrow peaks, and when you have an oxide, you often have broad peaks for something called phonon broadening. And so, so that's an example where you can have peaks of different widths, but um, in many circumstances, like the carbon 1S spectrum, the peaks all just kind of have the same width, more or less, but people would put in really, you know, peaks of, 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 of extreme you know, with, with extreme differences in widths. And there was just no good chemical reason for doing this. Um, another problem that we would see in the fitting is that sometimes people just put lots of synthetic peaks in a fit. So maybe here's some data right here, and they just start throwing in fit components, whether or not there was any good reason to do it. Now, if you're going to put a fit component, if you're going to put a synthetic peak, a, you know, a fit component into a fit, you really ought to have a good chemical reason for doing so. You should have thought about the sample chemistry and what the sample is supposed to be and everything like that. Now, of course, if you throw in a lot of peaks, you can match the peak envelope pretty well, but that doesn't mean that your fit has any chemical information at all. And, and again, this is sometimes what we see. And not only that, people would throw in peaks like this, and then they wouldn't constrain them. So we end up with some that are really narrow and some that are really broad, and, 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 and none of it makes any sense when we're done. Um, another thing that we would sometimes observe is that people sometimes try to interpret really noisy data when, when there's no information that's possible there. So, so literally, you know, we have spectra like this, and, and I can, you know, and, and, and people would be like fitting it to three peaks or something like that. And it's like, there's, there's so much uncertainty associated with data that are this noisy. You just can't pull this kind of information out of the, out of the data. Okay, well, what happened in the red category? Um, if we had a lot of really bad orange problems, then we might give the paper, or at least the spectra, a red rating. And I keep saying paper, but I just mean the spectra. We never graded the science in the papers. We never cared about what, you know, you know any, we didn't care about the rest of the paper. We just looked about at, at the XPS data. Um, sometimes there was extreme truncation of the peak envelopes. Um, sometimes there was a gross failure to make the background match the noise around the peak. Um, extremely widely varying peak widths was another issue, adding far too many synthetic peaks to a fit. So you can see these are more extreme examples of those orange errors, um, attempting to fit extremely noisy data. So maybe I drew more of a, what, what a red spectrum would look like instead of an orange one before. Um, not including spin orbit splitting. We just said that's really important. 
it's surprising how often it's not it, 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 it's not present in fits. And then the fits are just meaningless. They're, they're completely wrong. <coughs> but this also includes getting the ratios right for the components. Um, you, you remember I talked about there, there are some certain ratios, two to one, three to two, four to three and all that. And also there are certain um, differences between the peaks um, <coughs> in terms of energy differences. Those should be there as well. If that's not there, boy, you, you know, the, the spectrum might just be wrong. Um, here's another error that we saw. Sometimes people don't even show their original data. They just show the synthetic peaks, the fit components, and then they claim that's a spectrum. And, um, you know, that, I'm, I'm just not, I'm not, a, I'm not very comfortable with that. That almost seems a little bit unethical when they're claiming to show real data. And then this really just goes into the carbon 1S spectrum right here. And I'll let you read this um, if you'd like, but there, there are, you know, people can mislabel um, the, the different fit components. Um, there, there, there are a number of issues associated with, with SP2 type carbon. Um, it, 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 it shows asymmetry in its peaks. There's something called a shakeup peak as well that you get with a, with a carbon 1S spectrum. Again, all of this would be discussed in a more complete class, but, but there are a lot of ways to, to mess up the, 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 the peak fitting. Um, and, 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 and as a result of this, if you, if you do kind of, if, if you don't do these things right, um, you can have a red rating when you're done, or at least that's what we'd consider it. And what that means again is that as far as we're concerned, there just isn't any useful information there. Um, and, and of course, this wasn't the complete list. There are other ways that you can misfit um, data. So how bad were things? Well, sorry, things were pretty bad. Um, we have we've now published this. So this was just published, in fact, just a couple of weeks ago. Um, and... Um, and um, maybe maybe we'll let we can start here. Here is all the data together. So this is all of the papers we looked at. We see about a third of the papers, a third of the spectra are in the red category, another one third are in the orange category. <clears throat> what this was is this is three different journals. We call them A, B, and C that we looked at. I should emphasize we looked at really good journals. These are journals from top publishers. One impact factor was twenty five. Another one was I think the other two were four or five. So good, solid journals, really respectable places. Um, you know, I like to publish in one of these journals. It's a really good journal from a really good publisher, um, but, but there's just a lot of bad peak fitting. If we just look at those about two thirds of the spectra that are, that are peak fit, that are analyzed, the number of red papers goes to 40% and the number of orange goes to another 40%. Uh, you know, and, and, and you might say, you know, is this even believable? Well, one of the reasons that we tried to work with a committee, one of the reasons we tried to, to get a, a reason, you know, six people looking at this, six experts. Um, and, and I should say we've, we've shared this with, with, with multiple experts in the community and, and no one doubts for a minute that these results are real, that things really are this bad because this is simply what we're seeing in the scientific literature. And so there's something of a crisis that's going on in material characterization. And um, it, it, it simply, again, it, it, it behooves all of us to be very careful how we publish. And, and maybe that should bring me to, maybe just as an aside, I'll say this. One of the things that we've done for years in my research group is when we have gone and we've used a different technique, a technique that we're not experts in, and, and an example is transmission electron microscopy. We go and we work with an expert, and that expert becomes an author on our paper. When we, you know, and, and that expert at BYU is Richard Van Fleet. When we do X-ray diffraction, we go find Stacy Smith, who's a real expert. She's amazing at what she does. Stacy becomes an author on our papers, and, and she, she puts she puts just a terrific analysis, as does Richard, of, of what happened with the XRD and what happened with the TEM. We go and we find the right experts um, to do our work. Um, so, so again, if we can't get the expertise ourselves, and there just isn't time to learn everything, then we find the right person to do it. Um, this spectrum or this plot right here just shows the unfitted data. So when people just kind of showed the raw data and really didn't do much to it, um, then in general, the, the data were pretty good, except in the case of this journal where there were just lots of kind of, you know, dumb mistakes. But this was the most general scientific journal. This right here was, a, this was a surface and material journal. And as we said in our paper, this was a kind of a battery energy journal right here. Okay, so um, I, I think it may be, yeah, I, I, we're about to the point, well, We'll, we'll, we'll just say this very quickly. This isn't so important right here. Again, this would be in a more advanced topic. 
But what we were able to do is we were able to look very carefully at which elements are being analyzed most in XPS. And I'll just, I'll just give you the results right here, both online at a, at, at a searchable database there and in our, um, in our survey of the literature, we find that carbon and oxygen are the two most analyzed elements. Um, and in fact, we just, we just had a paper accepted that's on carbon 1S peak fitting. Um, so that was just accepted. Um, and um, this, this just says that among the top elements and the top elements um, that are in the literature that people analyze are carbon, oxygen, nitrogen, sulfur, and titanium. There, there are simply a lot of errors there. So again, you can kind of um, read through this slide. And if you want, um, you could go um, look at this paper that was just published. Um, so what's being done about this? Well, um, I think that the, the short courses that SBC um, is putting together are so incredibly timely. And I do want to emphasize that the errors that we're seeing in XPS are, 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 are not just, well, the errors that we're seeing in the literature are not just with XPS. Um, if you talk to experts of other material, material characterization techniques, you're finding the same levels of errors are appearing with those techniques as well, whether that's AFM or, or whatever it may be, TEM or, or um, it's, it's just um, people are under a lot of pressure um, um, to publish. Um, in general, you're expected when you publish to, to use multiple characterization tools to show data from multiple characterization tools. And so, um, you know, nobody can be an expert in everything and, and, and people get the impression that sometimes the, the data from these techniques are, are, are simple, to, simple to work up and often that's not, not the case. So um, I mentioned that Don Bayer from PNNL um, suggested that we write a bunch of guides and we've been writing these guides. Here's one of them right here. There are about 25 of these guides that are appearing right now. Um, in, 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 in JVSTA. So this again is the Journal of Vacuum Science and Technology A. And um, this is just a great set of, of, of papers. If you're working with another technique, um, go find similar tutorial information. There's tutorial information being published all the time. And then again, um, I, I, I really think that maybe some formal training in the form of, of, of a short course or something like that from SVC um, might be a good idea if, if, you're, if you're trying to learn more about one of these techniques. So um, these guides that were written have 20 unique corresponding authors um, and, and a total of 70 authors. And I think that me and my group, out of the 25 or so that are being published, I think we're on about five of them. So um, we're very fortunate to have been able to contribute here. Okay, so this brings me basically to the end of the presentation. Um, XPS, wow, really important. Great way to get a lot of information about surfaces. The most important, the most widely used technique for analyzing surfaces. Um, unfortunately, um, XPS has gotten ahead of itself a little bit. It's so valuable that everybody wants to do it. And, and, and people haven't taken the time just because it takes time to really become good at the technique. So again, lots of errors entering the literature. This is a problem, especially for non-experts because they have a hard time knowing what's right and what isn't right. Um, again, this is not just a problem with XPS. This is a problem in general with the scientific literature. And in fact, um, this report right here recently showed that data reliability in a paper decreases as the impact factor of the journal increases. Um, and so we as a community need to think about how to do better. And I don't, I, I, I don't wanna leave anybody here um, with the sense that um, science is bogus or that what we're doing isn't accurate or, or matter or that good information can't be extracted from these techniques. I remain very, very optimistic about science. I, I, I think that what's happening right now is, 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 is simply, it's, it's, it's a speed bump. It's something we have to figure out how to get around. We have to figure out how to do a better job, but I have a great deal of confidence in, in um, our ability to do better, not just with XPS, but with all these techniques. And um, again, I'm going to put in this plug for, for these short courses at SVC and the other tutorial information that's out there. Um, if you don't know what you're doing, consider going, consider taking a course, consider, you know, looking up some of this information so that you can do a better job and not make some of these mistakes. Well, anyway, I thank you for your time and um, wish you all the best. And I think that's the end of my presentation. So I, I hope this has been, been helpful to, to some of you. Thank you so much, bye. Matthew, let me thank you for a very well done and uh, well-constructed uh, presentation. Uh, I, for one, for one, learned quite a bit. Uh,
what I've done is opened up the microphones of uh, our attendees. So if anyone has a specific question for uh, Dr. Lanford, uh, please feel free to ask. Ben, would you like to uh, ask your question live? Sure. Hi, Professor Lenford. So when I did my master's you know, at my research group, we'd have a characterization facility on campus. There's an expert that works with XPS. You know, he trains students on how to use it. And sometimes he was relying for peak fitting if we weren't going to use the instrument a whole lot because he was like a wizard at doing it. Now you mentioned that there's these articles talking about proper XPS fitting and that your group's on five of them. Is there a repository of them somewhere or are they all published in a single um, journal? They're all published <clears throat> as a special issue of JVSTA um, and, and also for a limited time they will be available as a book and, and not, not really as a book but more as a kind of a thick paperback um, book and um, if you send me an email, I will send you Don Bayer's email and you can get on that list. I think it'll be something like $30. But again, all of that information is at JVSTA. Thank you. Any additional questions? Well, with that, thank you all for joining us today and uh, be safe. <laughs>